have Greg King. Greg will help me moderate the forum, um, and I do thank him for actually inviting the community to today's forum. I also have Lily Lee, the president of the company. Uh, Lily will be on standby for answering any questions and um, showing parts of the software as well. Uh, so today's forum is about the QCI process. We'll uh, take the beginning slow and let um, all of the attendees join. Uh, but uh, today we're expecting uh, New Jersey, Louisiana, a few people from the state of Maryland, California, Rhode Island, Kansas, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. And the purpose of this me meeting is really to foster a community of discussion around the QCI process. And I hope, um, I think I might have just lost control of the presentation. There we go. Can everybody see my screen again? Yes. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions as we go along, uh, we'd like to foster dialogue. So feel free to use the telephone. The telephone number is included in the audio section of the GoToMeeting control panel. If you're pretty confident in your computer microphone, uh, you can press the, the hands raised button, and um, I can unmute you. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave everybody in a muted uh, status right now just so we minimize uh, background noise. But um, we really would encourage you to talk. So if there's anything, you can use the chat box and you, or you can just uh, press the raise hand button on the GoToMeeting control panel. Uh, if there's any questions at all, let me know. But if not, we'll get started. Okay. Today's agenda, uh, I would like to discuss, maybe take two minutes and tell you the impact of your data through WAP Online. As we each operate individually as a state, uh, we don't have the overall picture of what our data means to the DOE weatherization program and in general to the low income population. Um, I would like to introduce everyone. Uh, through that, I will introduce uh, you from the states you represent. And then we'll get into the presentation part. First, the state of Pennsylvania will discuss their QCI development and process. Then the state of Virginia will discuss their current QCI process. Finally, the state of Maryland will discuss not uh, concentrated on QCI, but in general system controls. And I hope you can see my screen. Lily, can you see my screen? Danielle, Danielle, we can. Danielle, we can see your screen, but uh, your voice was not as good as earlier. How is my voice right now? No, it's fine now. Yes. Thanks. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, it looks like I'm. Some the 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 screen isn't showing. So just let me know if you don't see my screen change. Uh, so what I was going through is the state of Maryland will discuss invoicing and system controls, and finally I will muted. I will show you WAP Online and how we implement the QCI process within WAP Online to help you uh, formulate a plan about your state-specific QCI process. So what your data means in two minutes. Um, as you probably know, we collect a lot of information about your energy savings measures, your health safety measures, and your total uh, production. So I'd like to give you a high overview of since uh, since the last five years of using WAP Online, what that data really means. Uh, we have a combination of large states and very small states, and uh, collectively, you all have processed over $800 million in energy efficiency measures and health and safety measures. So what that translates to um, energy bills for the low-income population is just under $80 million saved on energy bills. So it comes out currently to $78 million. So we'll be happy um, through the next year. I'm sure that will reach the $80 million mark. Would it translate to energy savings? Is you can imagine uh, 640 million kilowatt hours saved through your efforts. 
and this translates to 630,000 um, of CO2 abated. Okay, now that you have that high glimpse of what your data means, I would like to uh, pass the presentation part over to Lynette Praster. Lynette, I am going to um, unmute you now. Lynette, you are now unmuted. Can we hear you, Lynette? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Great. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Daniel. I appreciate the opportunity to explain uh, what we've been doing here in Pennsylvania. If you could go to the next slide. In a nutshell, our summary of approach dates back to July of 20. the college work plan and talked about the many certifications that were going to be required of our workers. And I'm sure you all think, remember back to that and think of how stressful that moment was when we all left and said, what do we do now? And that's definitely the feeling that we had when, when we walked away from that meeting. But as we, uh, you know, really considered the, the approach um, everything that was going to be required, the changes that were going to be needed. Uh, we had one little added element that made a difference for us, and that was the fact that we had two accredited training centers in our state. Uh, two of our centers were working towards IREC accreditation and have achieved it in some or most of the home energy professional certifications. So in the beginning, Pennsylvania thought that we would perhaps contract out for the QCI work. We thought that might be the better approach, do a third-party approach uh, with contracting, keep it outside of the state monitors, keep it outside of the current network. But because we had the two accredited training centers, and also we have a committee from our policy advisory council that is very active with weatherization issues. And they also expressed a desire for us to reconsider our approach. And instead of going to a third party, uh, we worked together actually rather speedily because of the money, the training and technical assistance money that happened to be available to us in the 13-14 fiscal year. We set up an entire training program and testing process through our accredited centers and offered it out to our network. So we had probably about 75 people who applied to go through the QCI testing process. Currently to date we have uh, trained and certified about 55 quality control inspectors. And it really was the efforts of our training centers and our committee who made this possible. The committee then, going to our third circle there, also took on the responsibility to develop a checklist for the quality control process. And um, you'll see the checklist in a few minutes, but the checklist actually, it, it started through a checklist that West Virginia already had out there regarding inspections. And our committee and our training centers worked on it to add in all of the control, quality control steps. So once we had that checklist at least um, put into the draft form that we all agreed on, we made it available to the field. We started making it available last October. That would have been October of 2014. So it took us a good year to put everything into place. Place that, that we needed before we could actually have a checklist that we thought we could use and a process that we thought might work and also some quality control and inspected certified individuals. So once the checklist went out in October, um, we actually asked for comments on the checklist itself. We received feedback, made a few little revisions, the committee met over and over again, and then in December, we put out what we called our final draft of the quality control inspection checklist. And we're asking for the agencies to pilot the form. So the circle there that says multi-agency pilot is really 
every single one of our weatherization agencies, we have 37 of them in the state, we're asking them to pilot the form and to actually conduct some QCI inspections on their completed site from April through June of this calendar year. And in connection with that, the last circle talks about field training and technical assistance. Again, because of the resources of the National Sustainable Structures Center in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, our accredited training facility, they are out in the field right now giving one-on-one -on -one instruction, basically, to the agencies who are testing the form. Now, I must be honest, not all 37 agencies are actively engaging in the quality control inspection process. We've had, we have some agencies who are really gung-ho and are really putting it to the task, test. We're getting a lot of feedback back from them. Our training center is providing a lot of good um, hands-on TA out in the field as they're putting these checklists into use. So um, we have a, about a fourth of them, I would say, that are very actively engaging right now. The, the rest of the network is, is taking some slow steps, some baby steps toward understanding the checklist and then putting it into play. Not all agencies have uh, quality control inspectors that are certified. Many of them are currently in training and still working on it. So our, our current plan is that we have until July 1 to implement this, so we will begin implementation on July 1. Will it be perfect? Will it be exactly what it needs to be? No, but we are implementing it on July 1st. So at this point, I think, um, Danielle, I would ask if you have any questions that you want to address or if you want to just go straight to the checklist. Great, Lynette. Uh, we do have one question coming in, and that's of the stages that you just discussed. Was any like more particular, was any challenging more than the others? What was your largest challenge of the stages you just discussed? Mm. Um, well, I have our monitor, Jim Anderson, sitting here saying passing the test and becoming certified. Is probably, it probably is the biggest challenge, and it's not really listed up there other than as it's called the QCI training program. But you know, this this quality control inspection test is very grueling. Uh, it really is. And it, it's been a challenge to the folks in the field. Um, folks were feeling very fearful of the whole idea, knowing that all of their abilities were being tested and basically thrown on the table. Um, so I think that there's been a high level of stress in Pennsylvania, probably enough to cause maybe some electric shock um, with what everyone's been through. But the end result of that is that a lot of people pass. Mm -hmm. Much better than the national average, right, which Jamie asked, added. So, you know, everyone was stressed, but a lot of folks were willing to take that next step and, and went through it, and they made it. So now we just kind of look forward to being able to try to implement this now with knowing that our folks, many of our folks, are, have met the test. That's great. Are there any other uh, questions? Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania is quite far along in the QCI development plan. So if there's any question, any, any more questions from anyone, um, Lynette, do you want to continue, and then I'll just interrupt you if any more questions come in. Okay, sure. Um, the next slide that we were going to go to was basically just the statement that we do have an inspection form that we had shared that with NASCAP, so some of the states that are on the call may have actually received it already. Um, do you have it, Danielle, to show, or, or is that something we can give to everyone later? Yeah, I do have it. Can you... Um there we go. Okay. Yep, it's up. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about the form, but you can just scroll slowly down through it, and everyone can read for themselves the sections that are included. Starts out with file review and quality assurance. Goes through some steps there. 
for looking at all of the, the everything in the file. Um, there's an on, then it goes into the on-site work assessment, listing the diagnostics, all of the testing that needs to be done, or we need to have proof shown that it was done, and also that the QCI is actually going to perform. Goes through heating, ventilation, air conditioning, combustion appliance, safety test results. You can keep going through the form there. The one thing that we did feel really great about was that when Hancock looked at our QCI form and checked everything that we were expecting to do in the quality control inspection, we found that there are places in Hancock for all of this, in the HES system, for all of this information. Most of it. Most of it. Okay, Jamie, our reporting director, is um, helping with the discussion here. But we were we were worried about that. Quite frankly, we were very worried. We weren't sure that there were spots for all of these measures, and for the most part, there are. And maybe with just some few, a few changes, right? We should be good. But and again, course, the, okay, go ahead. And of course, the advantage to that is that the QCI inspectors can do a good deal of the work before they get out into the field and save a lot of time. Lynette, we do have a question. Uh -huh. And Scott, why don't I try to unmute you, and if there's any audio, I'll just read your question. It looks like you might be muted. Scott, Scott can you unmute yourself? Do you have a, mic you have a microphone? Um, just in case he can't. Scott's question is, uh, Lynette, do you anticipate using this checklist for all of your weatherization jobs or just for your DOE-funded projects? We're looking at all of them. In fact, we're, we, the state of Pennsylvania does receive LAHI funds as well, and we conduct probably about 70% about that standard weatherization. So, Between yeah, yeah about so, maybe yeah. sixty percent of our allocation from LIHEAP is used for standard weatherization. So absolutely, the QCI inspection will be used for those jobs. Um, in, in addition, we've been making a lot of efforts to coordinate with our public utility commission and all of the utility company projects. Now that's going to be a little more work for everyone to agree on standards. But we're, we, we're having a major conversation on a statewide basis through our policy advisory committee where we're explaining the standard work specifications to the utility companies and really conversing about the advantages to um, using or at least adhering to the SWSs, whether or not they will adopt a quality control inspection process. Not too sure about that, but at least here, from the DCED perspective, all of our weatherization agencies, whatever weatherization work they do through the Department of Energy funds or through the LIHEAP funds, we will conduct QCI. As you go through the form, again, it's, it's self-explanatory. I think you can read through it. As Jamie had said, our efforts were to try to capture everything that a, an inspector would be able to check on, all the data, everything in the file, and have everything at their fingertips before they actually go out on site. So please, you know, take a look at our checklist. It is still in draft form, but we're willing to share it, obviously. And again, it, the, the format of it and a lot of things that are in it actually got started in West Virginia and we just kind of took it and worked from it. So are there, are there any questions about that? Moving on then, I guess some I of our, I'm sorry. I was just going to tell you I don't see any additional questions coming in yet. Okay, I, since you didn't show anything, I kept going here. Okay, our challenges. Um, right now, our prior, what we in Pennsylvania we use priority measures for our weatherization work, and they are due to, due to expire. 
So we're kind of at a pivotal point right now in looking at the, the standardization of weatherization with the SWSs, obviously, and then the quality control inspection process, and then we have the audit that we need to be concerned about. Um, and continuing to use specific Pennsylvania priority measures does not appear to be the best choice for us at this point. So we do have agreement from our policy council to move forward on standardizing an audit across the state. And this will be a growth for us because every agency has been, although we've had priority measures, they have been able to use their own process of audit. So this will be a major change for us. But it just seems to be what we need to do at this juncture in the program. So we will be looking to maximize the use of ATS across all 37 agencies. That's uh, still something we've been working on. And our questions ahead are whether or not we would you know, consider using the HEAT app and also perhaps automating the QCI process as well. I know there have been suggestions from our training center and from some of our quality control inspectors that when they look at our form, they say, gee, wouldn't that be great if that was automated? So we have many challenges ahead. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much, Lynette. And I will sure. share uh, your QCI form as an attachment after the webinar to all of the attendees. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Next, um, next the state of Maryland, um, Mary Rousey, would like to discuss some controls that sh her state uses within WAP Online. Um, that their QCI process isn't finalized yet, but these system controls they're hoping will help implement a QCI, an easy uh, transition to a QCI inspection. Mary, I'm going to unmute you, and I hope you have a computer mic. Hello, Mary. Mary, uh, we cannot hear you. So we will go to Virginia. And we'll put Mary um, after Virginia. Uh, I'm going to unmute. Uh, hello, is Virginia hello, on the line? This is Hi, Virginia. Brian. Can you hear us? Hello. Yes. All right, great. Great. Hi, okay, everybody. let me bring up your presentation. My name is Brian Burris. I'm here with Tom Stevens. Hello. Can everybody hear us okay? All right. You're all muted. <laughs> You're all muted so. so, Danielle, I'll just go ahead and say, like, uh, well, I want to thank uh, Pennsylvania for all, all that, that good info. Um, we didn't really uh, tailor this presentation for, like, the entire process. It was more of um, sort of Hancock-specific stuff with our QCI. So I hope that's okay, and if we need to expand on um, how we got to um, the decision we, we arrived at, that's fine also. Um, so it looks like for, for our network, as far as just like a little update before we get into the presentation, we, have, uh, we do have an IREC accredited training center in Virginia that's helped um, a, a lot to get us uh, you know, the, the amount of QCIs needed to move forward with this. Um, so I'd say right now, most agencies do have somebody that's QCI certified. Um, in Virginia, we have, um, you know, it's a pretty big state as far as like, you know, some, some people are really close to an urban uh, setting. Some people are in really rural areas. So we had a challenge deciding which, um, which method of QCI, um, I guess, that's what I'm looking for here. Um, which way we're going to go with the QCI as far as the 5 or 10% uh, from the quality work plan. Um, so that's sort of where we are going with this presentation and some of the questions that we might have. Is, is that okay, Danielle? 
You still there? Can yeah, everybody... that sounds great. Okay, okay, good. So, no so basically, questions so far. All right. So starting with this, uh, what you see on the screen here, we decided um, out of the, the, the three options that we're giving um, for the quality work plan, we decided to go with, you'll see at the bottom there, we went with a third option. So you could do the first option is the auditor and QCI are separate, actual separate people. Um, and with this option, you know, the monitoring stays at 5%. five percent. Uh, the second option would be the auditor and QCI are actually the same person, or they can be the same person, um, but that would um, bump up the, uh, the monitoring scrutiny to 10%. Um, and the third one would be that the grantee develops their own plan, which is sort of the, the route that we decided to take. Um, so this opens up a couple cans of worms as far as how we're going to monitor this or how we're going to keep track of the, um, the numbers. So that's where this, this sort of uh, these questions start to arise. Danielle, you could go ahead and forward that slide. So we decided um, instead of having, there's going to be a mix of 5 and 10 percent agencies across the state of Virginia. Um, and this presented a problem for tracking that uh, we're hoping Hancock can, or maybe other states can help us find a solution. So because some agencies are really small, they can't, um, they can't have a separate auditor in QCI, or maybe geographically they're sort of isolated, for example, uh, like the Eastern Shore, uh, where it's not very easy to find QCI people that could um, perform those services, those final inspections. So we decided to allow agencies to select whether they would be a, uh, for lack of better category, a 5% or 10% agency. Um, we are going to have them, the plan, the plan now is to have them declare um, their, their plan at the beginning of the contract year. So they will be able to say either, yes, we're going to keep them, uh, the QCI and the auditor will be separate people, um, or they might be the same person. Um, so we're going to allow them to move a little bit because of, um, you know, changes that might happen during the contract year. But the, the two purposes that we're looking at, uh, or the reason we're going to go this route, is we, we really want them, and DOE, I feel like, really wants them to, to be independent. The whole uh, intent of the QCI and quality work plan was to have an uh, independent set of eyes examining the jobs. All right, so with that in mind, um, we really would like to push everybody to use an independent QCI, uh, but we realize that that's not possible in all cases. Um, so the other reason that we're going to allow a little bit of movement is because we don't know what might happen within the agency, um, you know, with, with staff changes. So we have to kind of account for staff loss. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Tom? Um, just that... We have some agencies that just run like one crew and do maybe two counties, and then we have other agencies that might have, you know, eight crews and service, you know, like 12, 15 counties. So we have to have something that's going to, you know, be able to fit the little guy as well as the, the larger agencies that have plenty of manpower and maybe have two or three QCI, uh, you know, certificate certified staff people. Um, so it's just we have to do, uh, get a little creative and let them either be 5% uh, state monitored or the 10% state monitored. And, and one caveat that we did um, internally decide on was that they, they're allowed to move, if they declare to be a 5% agency, which means that they would keep their auditor and their um, QCI person separate, they're allowed to go from a 5% agency to a 10% agency mid-contract, but you wouldn't be able to go from a 10% agency to a 5% agency. So we're really hoping that that will help, you know, some folks that were on the fence choose to just start off with the 5% um, from the beginning of the contract year. So, but we do understand that if you, you said, you know, hey, we're going to keep them independent, we're going to be a 5% agency, then you might lose staff that would, would not able, would enable you to continue down that um, independent, I guess, uh, path. So we would allow you to move um, mid-contract to the 10% uh, level. 
we don't have any questions on that, we can move to the next one. So some of the things that we've discussed internally here are, um, you know, things that we would like to see from Hancock or questions actually just, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to track this? Part of the quality work plan um, outlines that we have to keep track of, um, you know, how these jobs are being uh, finalized. So the first one is a QCI checklist. Um, so I have the notes here, this would mimic the actual QCI final inspection form that's still being refined. Um, sounds like Pennsylvania did a really good job, and I've, I've checked out the form. It looks great. Um, we have an internal one here. We actually have several. We have a what's called a Virginia Technical Assistance Group. Uh, we actually uh, use some, we meet quarterly throughout the year, and whenever the different agencies get together, and we also share things online, and we have several different QCI forms that have sort of been, um, I guess, beta tested for the last month and a half, maybe. Right. Um, and we're trying to get feedback. We meet in about two weeks. Um, our technical assistance group will be meeting, and we're going to kind of get together and really try to finalize what uh, our, our QCI final inspection looks like. Um, so hopefully we'll take um, elements from, from each of the different uh, inspection forms and put them together for the for the finalized super form. Um, let's see, just speaking about the QCI form a little bit more, I did put it out to DOE for review and some of the feedback that I got was that you know, we need to um, we need to add some way to uh, the SWS basically needs to be um, added to the inspection form. Now we don't need the actual full SWS language um, because that would get uh, pretty heady really fast. But we do need um, from DOE, they, they said that if any way that we can uh, incorporate some of the, um, the reference numbers from SWS might be a way to, uh, to do that. Um, also, we're not really sure what the final process is for approval or if there is a process for approval on the, uh, the final inspection checklist. So if anybody on this call has some uh, input into that, that would be excellent, or ways to incorporate the SWS language into the final inspection checklist. Um, we're, we're all ears on that. So I just wanted to kind of speak to that first, that um, you know, we, we have several versions of those, and um, in the end, there might be um, you know, several versions that get approved. Um, and we, we give a standardized final inspection sheet that uh, will work if your agency would like to use that. Or if you're on the cutting edge and maybe you, you're using iPads, your crew's using you know, some kind of digital app, um, you know, maybe that gets approved and it's able to be used as well. So um, we're, we're still kind of open and we're still very much in um, you know, kind of finalization of, of what that QCI form looks like. So. I'll move on from there. Um, Brian, there is one question uh, okay, before excellent. you continue. And that's, uh, when do you think you're going to go live with your QCI process, your QCI form, and how are you going to do that? Are you going to do all of the agencies at once, or are you thinking of a pilot of some sort? Um, we're actually just going to go live with it. Um, like I said, in two weeks we meet to kind of go over and, and hear our results from what the different agencies have been using from their own sheet. Um, so we're trying to just kind of culminate like what, what's working, what's not working, um, what we need to improve on. And um, also we, we have an inspection form that they've been using for years uh, that's pretty complete. So they're used to the process, they're used to uh, you know, verifying it on a piece of paper form uh, and inspecting the job and comparing it to the audit. So it's not such a huge leap. It's really just a different format and probably the reference to the SWS and maybe knowing, you know, the specifics of, uh, you know, what each SWS requires. So it's as far as the agencies are concerned, that they, they're kind of going through a similar process now with the uh, final inspection checklist. But the QCI will be just a, a more, you know, complete version of that. But we are planning, once, um, 
once we once we meet for the uh, technical assistance group, excuse me, we will um, we will kind of put together a final form and and put it out to the network for the I guess that would be the beta testing at that point. Um, but we we intend to go live with this. Um, July first. Yeah, July first. I mean, is is what we're shooting for. Uh, Brian, we do have a question from Lynette in Pennsylvania. And Lynette, I'm going to unmute you to ask your question. You're unmuted now. Hi, Lynette. Hello. Thanks for all your good information as well. Um, actually, I neglected to tell everyone that I have a table full of people listening here. It's not just me. She didn't introduce you. Um, <laughs> well, yes, I did not. And they're mad at me because I didn't introduce them. But I have our, our weatherization staff here. I have Jamie Reed, our reporting chief, and Jim Anderson, monitoring supervisor, Kathy Ruley, the compliance supervisor, and Ashley Sieber, and our weatherization administrative officer. And they've been answering questions with me and talking over everything they're hearing. But one question that came up from the table was whether or not you were using a standardized audit process. Obviously, we're very interested in that. And also, I ha we had another question that Ashley didn't get to put in there, and that was in regards to your 5% and 10% decisions. Um, if an agency chooses a 10% decision, do they also still have to QCI all of their jobs? Like, if they don't have a quality control inspector, I'm assuming they still have to have inspected all of their jobs. And would you, as the state of Maryland, do them as well? Virginia. Or Virginia, I'm sorry. I don't even know yeah, where so, I'm at. <laughs> OK, great question. Um, so basically, everybody, every single job that's completed, every weatherization job completed in Virginia will be finalized by a certified quality control inspector. Um, whether they are the auditor or an a QCI that's independent of the job prior to that. So they're coming in at the final uh, phase um, and completing that as a QCI. So the 10% jobs, the 10% agencies, they're still, you know, that final will be completed by QCI. But what makes it the 10% category is that QCI was also the auditor of that job. So that's okay. why they get bumped into the 10% additional scrutiny. OK, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. And we are doing, um, we do a combination of uh, the weatherization assistant, Meet Mia, and um, also the priority list. So we have, I would say, I would say roughly three quarters of the network um, is, are completing uh, the Meet Mia audits, and about, you know, the other 25% are still on the priority list. And we've actually had conversations to, um, we're, we're ready to move to 100% Neat, neat Mia with the network, and I, I think that's coming probably in the next year or so. We're going to try to make a push for that. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Did that did that answer the question though about the the ten percent aspect of it? Absolutely. We were just okay. a little confused, um, wondering how that was still going to work. But I see what you're saying. We're, we're you know, quite frankly, we're struggling with that as well. We have really one geographic area of our state that only has a few quality control inspectors certified. So many of those agencies are kind of struggling with how they're going to actually get that done, let sure. alone whether or not they would be a 5% or a 10%, you know. So um, we, I think we were c comparing what you said with the way we were arranging it, but I, I completely un we completely understand what you mean. Thank you so much okay. for the clarification. Yeah, no problem. Um, it's just you know, and we're planning for. We've actually had a meeting, or I had a meeting with the uh, with our training center this morning, and we're making plans for them to be available to perform QCI inspections uh, when agencies um, either have difficulties um, completing that, they lose staff, um, you know, any number of reasons that they might not have an available QCI person on staff. So that that's going to be our backup. Um, and there's also the possibility of uh, agencies sharing QCIs, so that's that's been brought up. But I don't think that our our network, you know, we we get along really well. But um, sometimes I don't know that 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 would be. Uh, I, I can't imagine that going over so well with every one of our agencies with them sharing uh, the the quality control inspectors or inspecting each other's jobs. 
Um, you know, I, I don't know how messy that might get, but yeah, we've yeah. talked about a number of different scenarios, like you know, reciprocity. Like if there was a neighboring, let's we'll say, up in the mountain region, we have a lot of small agencies, and we were talking about if you know, if you only have one person in there, an auditor and a QCI, would you be willing to have them QCI your neighbors and but likewise, the neighbor with QCI yours, um, and that may work. I don't know if it'll work for a whole year, you know, if, on a volume basis, uh, but it may be a fill gap. Yeah, we just don't want we don't want agencies to be you know dead in the water, so to speak, um, if they were to lose a staff member. Right. Yeah, so that, we're, that's we're really trying to look I'm sorry. How many, how many weatherization agencies do you have? We have 20. Thank you. Yeah, that, those points that you brought up are a real struggle, and we're kind of feeling those growing pains as well. You know, we, we thought that maybe there would be a more collaborative approach with the QCIs, where there could be some sharing, uh, you know, sharing of QCIs among agencies, bartering, so to speak, to figure out. You know, we've, we've been encouraging them to think about what each agency does best. If one agency has a really good crew of auditors, that perhaps they should do the auditing for an area bigger than a county, you know, for another, and actually audit for another agency, and then maybe in swap for that, the other agency could do QCI. But when, when rubber started to hit the road, um, then folks got a little kind of frantic about how they would really work that. And so our committee also came up with um, a whole a sort of a set of rules. It was really more or less a set of guidelines about how much a QCI could cost and what do you do about no-shows. And you know, it started to get into all kind of technicalities about one agency contracting for a QCI from another. And we don't have the final result on that either um, because they're still trying to work it out. So I, we understand what you're describing there. Sure. We, we just actually went through the reapplication process too and, and the territory territories kind of switched up. So we have, um, you know, folks that are kind of might be afraid of losing their territory or other folks gunning for other territories. So it makes uh, less of an environment of, of sharing at that point, too, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, if, if you have any other questions, or if we don't have any other questions, I could, um, I'll keep going. Or if anybody else has questions, we can chat about it. Danielle? I don't see any other questions coming in right now, so let's um, keep going. OK. So um, this is still, well, I, back up to the, the slide we were just on because I have just a couple more points there. Um, some of these are the things that we would have to work specifically with Hancock to figure out how to track these. So once we decide whether um, an agency is going to be a 5 or 10 percent agency, we have to know, you know, we have to be able to internally track those to be able to know what the monitoring needs would be for each agency. So that's part of the thing that, you know, the discussion that's going to need to be had with Hancock is, is how do we actually physically track those. So we've talked about it internally on how, how we're going to calculate this. And would this be a per invoice basis? Um, you know, some of the drawbacks to that were some agencies are really large, some are really small, some have to invoice very soon. Others could kind of sit on stuff to, um, reduce the monitoring scrutiny if we did it by invoicing. Um, so we just need to find a way really to, to track um, uh, this information in Hancock. Um, we need to be able to track the inspector's designation in Hancock. So we were talking about internally that maybe an additional weatherization role could be created for the tracking. Um, and that's how we would we would know, hey, this agency used the same person, so that's going to bump them into that, uh, this monitoring. Um, you, you, you might have, for example, you might have a 10% agency that, um, you know, uses a, a separate QCI person and a separate auditor, 
or you might have um, agencies that are sharing QCI people. So it's not really clear to us right at this moment how we will track that in Hancock, I guess. So I know it sounds really confusing because we, I guess we are confused about it at this point. Well, and one thing about the time period, we were thinking about, you know, like running a report or we, or we invoice period, but then we got to thinking about that and we thought, well, we don't want an agency managing an invoice. So they say, well, on this invoice, we'll only put jobs where we have a different QCI separate. So for this invoice period, they'd only have to, you know, uh, do 5% state monitoring. And then all the jobs, and this would happen with larger agencies only, they could kind of not have to bill immediately. And then, you know, go through their one, their invoicing with different QCI and different auditors and then load up maybe the last couple invoices with uh, the same auditor QCI so that they could kind of manage the state monitoring aspect of it. So, and so there's a lot of questions about the timing of when you would pull that report uh, and where they would fall, whether they're a 5% or a 10%. Hopefully just that, that broad category of if you're a 5 or 10% agency would dictate that. But we do have agencies that have tried to break it down even further um, to say like, well, if I am a 10% agency, you know, can I be a 10% part of the time and 5% part of the other time? And our answer to that, and most of the guidance suggests that, that that's not the intent. So you would be a 5% or a 10% agency for the duration of the contract period. But this, this slide was basically saying like, hey, we, we do need to work with Hancock to find a way to creatively track this information and to be able to, to look at it. Brian and Tom, do you use our um, state monitoring module now to enforce a percentage of inspections? I do not. No. So that might be a good starting point. Um, we don't do the difference between 5 and 10 percent, but we do track per funding source the percentage of state monitoring. And I don't know, um, I know Marilyn uses that. I'm not sure if uh, I can unmute Mary right now to talk about that. Um, she could probably help you. Let me try. Mary, are you on the telephone where if I am, where we can hear you right now? I think she emailed me. She's having some audio difficulty. She, she actually says she's going to change in her computer. So. Okay, but what they do is um, in, in the monitoring section, in the workflow, and I can bring it up on the screen if you want. Um, let me show my screen for a minute. In the workflow section, there is um, state monitoring or program-wide quality assurance. And what this does is all the jobs eligible, eligible to be state monitored filter on this list. And you can perform your uh, statewide inspections on this list. And there's a monitoring report down here where you can select the funding source, like a DOE or obviously DOE and the date range, and the report will tell you the number of uh, monitored jobs and the percentage monitored versus the eligible amount to be monitored. So maybe that's something to consider as you need to track uh, the percentage that you're performing. Okay, excellent. We'll, uh, we'll definitely look more into that. Let me get back to your presentation. Okay. And you can go ahead and advance that slide. So this is something you might have just answered my question uh, pending the, um, I guess, the level of detail from those from the monitoring report. But one thing since, um, and I've only been in this role a little over a year, um, so I'm still, I don't feel like I'm exactly a Hancock expert at this point, but um, I do find that uh, when I'm trying to determine which jobs to monitor, um, 
I, I've kind of figured out, I have my own process, but I, I definitely think it could be better. And one of the things that um, I'm, I'm proposing, and, and which you might, you might tell me that, hey, we, the, this, what you just showed me could, could very well fix this, but I was looking for a way to actually select uh, jobs with a little bit more detail. Um, when you only have maybe two or three jobs for an agency that I have to look at, I want to make sure that I get a really good sample of, of what they're doing. So in order to do that, you can advance uh, or just uh, hit the space bar once um, for, the, for the rest of the slide there. Danielle? Yeah, there you go. Um, hit it one more time. Yeah, there we go. So right now, um, I use the I, what I do is I go in the paid invoice statistical report, and that gives me a pretty good idea because I have building type, I have funding cycle, I have address, um, I have you know is it gas, is it high use, and I'll typically just kind of pull some some numbers from there and then go into the job itself to look at details. But if there was like another way to look at you know stuff like um, location auditor QCI. Um, cost, funding, a blower door, pre and post, building type, foundation, um, heating system, fuel source, if it was replaced or not. Some, you know, some of these bigger items are, are things to help me sort of uh, really nail down uh, a, a good sampling uh, set to, to take a look at. That, that would be really helpful. So you, I'm hoping that you'll just say, yeah, we already have something like that, and you're just a, a dummy for not using it at this point. <laughs> Um, but I was hoping that's kind of on my wish list, and it would make my job a lot easier because it just feels a little clunky now uh, when I'm going into select jobs to monitor. And we also put in the middle there, you can see, like, it'd be nice to have a breakdown of, you know, uh, the measures that were installed with that report, whether they be ECM or health and safety items. That's great feedback. I think all of the data points you listed here, we do collect, so maybe we need to... Uh, work with you and everybody else on a way to present that to you I mean, from a high level that gives you the option to drill down also yeah that, that would be awesome um, because at this point if I'm if I'm looking at an agency with 20 jobs I'm much less concerned because I know I'm going to get a, a little bit of everything but I don't want to um, you know set a whole monitoring on just you know uh, if I'm only doing two or three jobs like I really want to make sure I get kind of a mix and it it's just it's sort of it's sort of clunky to go in and, and get that information now. It is available, but you do have to dig for it. So if there, was a, if there was a way to get all this together in one sort of overall overview, you know, report or summary, that, that would be awesome. Yeah, I think if we show you the um, more of the state monitoring module and how you can use that. Mm -hmm. And also as part of this, if you were interested in turning on any of the controls, we have like a spending controls or... Um, measure level control, for example, if I tell you, I'll go through the uh, the monitoring flow in a little bit more detail, and okay. then and then maybe we can tailor the the feedback or the the report based on what we go through there. So that's uh, that's really helpful knowledge uh, today. And like I said, I, it's probably not the best way to, to do it using the uh, paid invoice statistical report, but it is what you know we it's what we've been doing at this point, and, and it has worked, but it does take a little bit of extra time to, to get those numbers. And Brian, just a comment that Scott in Kansas, I don't think he has audio, but um, he thinks for Kansas it would be very helpful to have a summary list of jobs showing details in one place where you can drill right. down. I can show you some of those controls and options later in the presentation too when you're finished. No problem. Um, you can go ahead and advance that slide. So here's some, um, this last slide, I think it's the last one, but these are some questions that have come up internally that we have been just kind of mulling over and we don't really know the answer to at this point and we were hoping that, you know, more conversation with Hancock, more conversation with other states using Hancock. Um, so based on this process, we need to know, um, you know, what level of detail um, would need to be in the Hancock QCI inspection form, would that, would that basically mimic um, the final inspection form that we have on paper or the digital version. Um, so what do you guys need from, from the states? What does Hancock need from the states 
uh, in order to get that, that QCI form um, in Hancock? And what would that look like? So that's, that's one question. Um, I don't know if you want to just address these or just kind of go over this stuff and address them point by point later, Danielle? Uh, we or can just address it. OK. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that's like a great, actually, a reason why we hosted this forum to see if the states were interested in eventually automating their QCI process, so reducing the administrative process around implementing QCI. And from our perspective, what we need is um, we needed the discussion to start if there's any standardization or common functionality that you share within your QCI process. And ideally, we would want to implement something flexible. So um, given the existing controls in Hancock, I know, Brian, I reviewed your, QC, your QCI draft and also Lynette's QCI draft. And like Lynette said, a majority of those fields, the control exists. So um, it's actually taking a lot of the legwork out for us for implementing it. We would just read those controls and implement a final QCI checklist, uh, probably at the inspection stage of the workflow. Okay. So I think to answer your questions, we would need to know if there's any gaps uh, that are in your QCI for form that Hancock does not control today. If there are no gaps, then we really need to work on um, setting up the format of the report for you and custom, you know, customizing, hopefully, with the intent of standardizing. Uh, it does, you know, if, if maybe that's a, a wish, but standardizing the format. OK, great. Uh, this, the second question here, um, or I will tell you just one point to add to that uh, about the uh, QCI inspection form, there have been rumblings of a national QCI form, so that might also be something that might come into play with Hancock um, or with the different agencies or, or I'm sorry, the different networks that are listening today. Um, so I don't want to speak too much about it, but I, I have heard from DOE that there is talk of a national QCI form, so that might be something helpful for folks that are struggling to develop these or. Um, or it might be that might be good for Hancock to get maybe a, a standardized, you know, national form or something. Uh, this is a Lily. Uh, I think I, we have some questions that people can think about it. We do know our customers running different programs. Uh, most of them have DOE, but some of them tell us DOE is not their main funding source. So the question, the number one question is, should we design one for? all funding source, or should we design a way that different funding source works differently? So that's one question I think everybody should think about that. The other one is, OK, if that's the case, uh, within different states, can we standardize the, the, the same form for everybody to use? Or each state say, no, we want our own version. So that's something to think about it, too. OK, excellent. Um, today, we really have, I don't think every state is using it, we do have state monitoring functions. I know on top of my head, for example, the state of Maryland is using that really well. They really use that to monitor the state programs. Um, but I don't know, so we also know in the heat, in the mobile side, the currently we do inspection, mostly just inspect the measure that has been installed. I think the QCI, excuse me if I haven't studied too much about this, is have more than that. They may want to also want to answer some questions very generically about the job. So I think we probably have to enhance our current uh, inspection module to include more information on the QCI part. Does anybody want to comment on that? Well, they just might need other aspects of the job or other activities like, um, you know, client education or um, crew interaction. Yeah, crew interaction, those types of other activities that are not just strictly a measure. Good point. Yes, great point. We, we should have these standardized, non-measure, direct install measure type of information 
more about customer satisfactions, um, you know, the quality and how interactions, those questions should be in there. I just saw a hand raise. It might be Scott. I don't know if this is um, outdated or not. Scott, can you, um, I unmute you. Do you have a question? Hi, Scott. Hey, you guys. Said? Yeah, I, I was just going to chime in on that, Lily, and I think you're right. I think the current um, inspection module wouldn't be uh, inclusive of all the things that we're looking for at a final inspection. Now, I don't use that yet that module, the, you know, the, the tablet infield inspection stuff, but just by my review, you know, there's a lot of things, CAS diagnostics, um, pressure differences between zones, some of that stuff uh, might have to be beefed up to be able to meet the QTI requirements. Good point. Thank you. And I think, Danielle, we probably should just unmute everybody so anybody can talk. Just make sure they mute themselves if they don't talking. Um, okay, do you want to go ahead and do that? Okay, let me see. Okay, I can't. So it's, a, it's a no way. I'm going to just go ahead and unmute everybody one by one. Meanwhile, Brian, if you want to continue... Uh, for these points. Please go ahead. Okay. The relevant point, I, Sorry, I think there is yeah, a way to track. I think there is going to be a way to track the five and ten percent. That's not going to be an issue. Um, and I think uh, let's see, one big question that we did have was the job designation role. So if we actually go in and, and have a new role designated uh, as for a QCI person, is there a way to track that? Um, for example, if a person is an auditor and a QCI, but maybe performs different functions with multiple subgrantees, so you know, I guess there would have to be um, each agency that used that person, they would have to be able to select uh, that that role under each agency. Did I say that right? Each agency. So, yeah. so if John. John Smith works for Agency X and Agency Y. Um, I guess John Smith would need it to be listed under that designation for both agencies so that it's that it's tracked properly. I guess I guess our, our point is we we start thinking about all the tracking scenarios. It gets a little it gets a little confusing, and I guess we just want to work closely with Hancock to make sure that that's really that process is smooth for the the way that we decide to to go after this, the 5 and 10 percent agencies. That's about it. Great. Um, it looks like Lily has unmuted everyone, so uh, if you want to mute yourself when you talk, it's the green button on the GoToMeeting control panel. You can unmute yourself. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Brian. You're welcome. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you, everybody. Okay, next we wanted to have uh, the state of Maryland talk about their control process, but I don't know if they were having computer trouble. Lily, do we have a... Yeah, she, she's not in now, but she was trying to die in again. Okay. Well, let's go over... Uh, I do want to go over one more time the list of attendees today, so if you did want to ask anyone a particular question, um, in addition to the states we have on today, uh, representing New Jersey, Louisiana, uh, not Maryland, it looks like they had computer trouble, California, uh, Rhode Island, Kansas, Pennsylvania, Virginia, it looks like uh, we also have a representative from SMS. And then we also have from the Hancock side, Art Wilcox, who is in charge of our um, energy modeling data collection. If you had any questions 
data so it's not customer information and then you see the presentation here uh, quickly I'd like to review the what we see the potential of how QCI can be automated um, right now you know I first have to start where this is our fall but every state that uses Hancock has a different name for Hancock. For example, uh, some states call it HDS, Hancock Energy Software. Uh, some states call it WAC Online. Um, Scott from Kansas, who recently circumstance. So in this section, audit info, if you turned on this control, you have a couple of options here. You have the full energy model, you have the priority audit, and you have a quick audit data collection. If a job is selected as full energy model, that's what turns on the controls for the required fields. Uh, Lily, please uh, monitor the questions as I go along and just interrupt me. Sure. So anything with existing conditions that's already collected, think about adding those to your QCI form. Second, uh, I would like to touch upon is the health and safety measures. Some example of possible QCI from uh, questions from the drafts I've seen are uh, health and safety measures such as uh, existing Nava tube wiring or dryer vent installations. And these health and safety are currently tracked in WAP online. And where they're tracked is in two places. Uh, the first place is the audit information screen. You have these checkboxes here. Um, talk to us if you need to change the checkboxes or if you need to add checkboxes. But really, this is focused on tracking health and safety requirements. Uh, the other one, the dryer vent install. For example, you know you customize, you build, or you configure your health and safety measures. Let's say you configure a measure called uh, dryer vent. All of the health and safety measures in WAP Online 
usually reside in the other measure screen. So for this example, if you wanted to track dryer vent, you could uh, add a vent, a health and safety vent option here, and then you can select it from this screen. And that's how you would implement, as we work with each state, um, when we print out the final QC form, we could do checks. We could uh, check for certain required information in existing. <laughs> Let's move through this um, quickly here. My next slide. Energy savings measure. The same is true for energy savings measures. Uh, I won't bring this up in the system, but possible QCI questions we've seen at Hancock are whether the uh, heating system has been replaced or whether a repair or clean and tune has happened. In the existing heating and cooling dashboard, we currently collect these fields as well as any baseload questions like a lighting, uh, CFL or LED, or um, anything about the hot water tank. Most of you are using uh, the up-to-date version that has the enhanced hot water tank screen. Uh, let me show you that really quickly. Within each job, there's a hot water section. And here we started to collect uh, the model information the size information, so everything in more detail about the hot water heater system. Finally, diagnostic test, tests. Um, as you know, the blower door test, the pre and post. This is currently collected on the air infiltration screen. We collect three data points here, pre, post, and target. Um, something that we're in the process of enhancing is ASHRAE compliance. We uh, currently, in most of your versions, support the ASHRAE 62 to 2010. Uh, but DOE is requiring a 2013, so it is in our uh, timeline to enhance our calculator to 2013. So if any of your QCI forms have any uh, language around ASHRAE compliance, you can use uh, WAP online to enforce that. And the last is the combustion safety screen. Um, I don't know if you all are using the new combustion safety screen, but under weatherization, you'll see a screen here called combustion safety. And this is designed for uh, best and worst case depressurization testing, so of any combustion safety requirements. Um, and like Scott has pointed out and the rest of you, we want to work as a community to enhance uh, these data fields if any information is missing. Uh, somebody pointed out, and I think this was Tom Stevens in Virginia, the need in the QCI process to track beyond an audit, but to track perhaps um, customer education. I think spending and invoicing control would go around this. For example, if part of your QCI was to track vendors, we do um, track work order vendors right now. And if part of your QCI is to track job completion, for example, are all of the measures installed before invoicing. That's currently a part of the um, embedded control processes. Uh, something for you all to think about is using our inventory system. Our inventory system lets each agency create an inventory uh, materials list. And then when WAP Online, uh, when you create a work order, the inventory, it reads the inventory, the agency's inventory, so that's something else that can help you enforce um, job control. Are there any questions? And I wanted to point out, that, lastly, as part of this, is if you do decide to go to a checklist format for things other than the energy audit, such as um, in Lynette's draft, as I'll distribute after this meeting. Um, she has a lot of uh, customer consent forms, release forms. We do track that in, as you all are using right now, we do track that in WAP Online. And when I bring that up here and I go to uh, documents, we have two spots. We track energy audit documents here in the weatherization section under documents. So you can see this state um, already has a lot of these forms embedded. We do have the feature to turn on and off to require these forms to be completed or uploaded. So if you wanted to actually require an electronic sort of file, 
could require that these forms are uploaded and the job cannot be invoiced uh, before these forms are uploaded. The other part of the forms, as you're all aware of, is the eligibility documentation in the client intake section. So this state requires that the proof of ownership be completed. Now, some of the program options I showed you today are controlled through a screen uh, called Program Options. Is everybody aware of this screen? Does anybody use it? Anybody unmute it? Wanna? They are unmuted, so. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I, I don't know if you and Tom are aware of the Program Options screen. Pennsylvania does use it. Great. Um, we use it too, but we don't change it very often. Great, and that's the that's the way to to use that screen is to not change it very often. And I was going to say, if you do want to change anything in this screen, please talk to your TAM first, because tr changing the options midstream could have effects on existing mm -hmm. jobs. Um, but this screen is under the section program information, and this is where a lot of the controls okay. are housed. You'll see it broken into different sections of the weatherization workflow, beginning with client intake, any controls that you want to require um, uploading here, uh, general options like allowing multiple income lines. This, just so you know, if you run a middle income program versus a low income program, WAP Online can support that. Then it's broken into intake. For example, like I showed you a few minutes, requiring um, the eligibility documentations to be marked as complete or uploaded. Then energy audit options. You can actually default the type of energy audit here. Um, you can make one energy audit. Um, you can allow a change or you can only enforce one type of energy audit as you standardize your approach to data collection. It goes to invoicing. This is where a lot of the fiscal controls are kept. Um, if you want it, and I wish I do wish Marilyn was here because what they've started recently is enforcing pipeline control. So, for example, if an agency doesn't have money in their budget uh, early in the pipeline, that that agency will be notified or the state will be notified and they can actually forecast their spending uh, early in the pipeline, not just at invoicing like we do now. So if you guys have any questions about program options, talk to your technical account manager because this can really introduce a, a, a granular level of control to your workflow. And this is Lily, and a couple things I want to mention a little bit. We recently did a case study with State of Maryland, really uh, talked to different agencies, the states, and understand how they use the software. No, I, actually, I didn't want it to be, uh, when you came in, I didn't want it to be all hot. In you know, you Virginia, if you can mute yourself when you not <laughs> speak to everybody, please. Thanks. Um, so if you need, want to see that, please uh, feel free to ask our TAMs to send you that case study. And they did indicate to us, uh, we by using the heat, really automate everything, it, uh, their productivity get doubled. So that's what we like to see. We like to see everybody's productivities really get improved compared, you know, before. Uh, the other things, a few things I think uh, we are on a let you guys know is um, quite a few states has gone DOE approval uh, with the using the heat to do their uh, as the energy new energy modeling tool. Uh, if you want to consider that, let us know. Uh, we will be assisting you to go through that DOE approval process, and we are also have SMS. Jim's is also on the phone too, and uh, you guys can also contact them directly. Ask, you know, how simple or how complicated that process is. Um, on top of that, I we heard a lot of requests about maybe enhancing our reporting tool. And one of the things I believe today was mentioned by Virginia is maybe they can before they do, Q, um, you know, uh, inspection, they can be able to search, understand the nature of the these jobs. So we were thinking about adding some uh, reporting tool engine that you can really create your own reports to really uh, study your data. Uh, that's still 
under in investigation. We're not sure when we can get it done, but it's our intent to offer that service to everybody too. Um, the other things we were thinking about is study on the heat side, not just for energy modeling, really try to design a tool that makes your site assessment easier, which means anybody can do it. In a way, come across as a conversation, questions and answers. Do you have, what's your heating system? Uh, if, if the answer is this one, you go here, answer that when you go there. So make it site assessment much easier. We try to design ways so it can be used by everybody. So that discussion is also in place. Great. Thank you, Lily. Um, so I will send out uh, this slide deck. I will send out the draft from Pennsylvania. I'll send out the case study uh, Lily's referencing to and some of the talking points that Lily brought up at the end if you have any feedback. Thank you all very much. Thank you for the active participation. And um, I hope you found this of value. I hope we could continue doing uh, these customer forums. If you have any topics uh, that you would like, please email info at HancockSoftware.com and we'll uh, tackle the next topic at the next customer forum. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye, everybody.